I'm Robin Gagnon. And I'm Eric Gagnon, and we sell restaurants. We started the nation's largest restaurant brokerage firm, We Sell Restaurants, over a decade ago. You can find us online at WeSellRestaurants.com. We're on your radio once a week with the leading authorities in this industry talking about subjects trending in the restaurant business. Tweet your own questions on our topic while we're on the air to our Twitter handle, Sell Restaurants, or post them on our Facebook page, facebook.com backslash We Sell Restaurants. If we don't get to your question, we'll be sure to follow up on our social media channels. Our goal is to satisfy your appetite for acquisition, feed the need for restaurant reality, and serve up a recipe for business success. If you have any ideas for our show or you have any comments, please email me. My email address is eric, E-R-I-C, at wesellrestaurants.com. Today's radio show focuses on the brew pub industry, where it's all about the local brew. What's special about the brew pub that's taking market share from the tried and true tap? Well, we're going to talk about a segment of the industry that's the most innovative and rapidly growing piece of the beer business. They had 18% growth just through July of 2013. We have three outstanding guests who will tell us why customers are thirsting for more from the brew. Absolutely, and we are joined today by Tony Ford, the editor of L Street News, the most widely circulated beer newspaper in America. Hi, Robert, yes, that's, um, I mean, Eric, it's Tony Forder. Forder. Tony Forder, my apology, Tony. And uh, you're a native of England. Tony has lived in the United States for over 35 years. For 22 of them, he has been the editor and co-publisher of Ale Street News, America's largest circulation beer newspaper. Tony has appeared as a beer expert for print and broadcast media, has presented a variety of beer events and dinners, and has led several beer tours in North America, Europe, and especially in Belgium. He recently chaired the panel of professional judges at the M Beer Contest in Rio de Janeiro. Tony, welcome to the show. Uh, pleasure to be here. All Thank right. Eric. We're also very fortunate today to be joined by Chris Rice. Chris is vice president of All About Beer magazine. It's in its 34th year. All About Beer magazine has told the story of tremendous diversity in the beer industry and the great people that make it. Jim Coach, the founder of Oak the founder of Boston Beer Company and makers of Samuel Adams, has described All About Beer magazine as the bible of our industry. Mr. Rice got started in the craft brewing industry by founding and operating Carolina Brewery nationally recognized brew pub in Chapel Hill. He's a member of the Board of Advisors to Lone Rider Brewing Company in Raleigh and graduated from the University of North Carolina, considers himself a loyal Tar Hill. Welcome, Chris. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And last but certainly not least, to provide an actual brewer's perspective, we are joined today by Brendan Heinz. Like a lot of would-be brewers, Brendan spent most time bouncing around jobs before discovering his brewing passion. The Marietta, Georgia native, worked in construction after graduating from Georgia Southern University, but lost his job when the real estate market went belly up. He and his wife moved to Iowa, where he got a job with the Army Corps of Engineers and started home brewing on the side uh, for fun. And after four years in the Alki State, his wife, also from Maryland, longed for home. It was a brewing position at Sweetwater Brewery that did the trick, and the pair returned to Georgia. Ultimately, it was their time spent hanging out around downtown Roswell, Georgia, and noticing how many Alfreda citizens we're doing the same that would convince him to up, open a beer spot a few miles north. Up Alley Brew Pub opened in Alpharetta in June of 2013, serving up five house-made beers alongside guest draft and bottles from the likes of Delirium, Nocturnum, 21st Amendment, and Alpharetta Local Jekyll Brewing. Brandon, welcome to the show. Thank you guys for having me. So there's no doubt that the craft beer idea is not a passing fad. The Brewers, Associ- uh, the Brewers Association cited growth of the industry in 2012 at double digit, 17% growth in dollars for the second consecutive year. Tony, let's start with you. The 17% growth in an industry where traditional restaurant sales barely broke the 3% mark in sales gains, does that mean the brew pub industry is taking market share from traditional pubs? Well, uh, there is certainly some of that, but um, those figures really reflect reflect more than just a brew pub. A brew pub is a restaurant where they make their own beer and serve their own beer, and they may have some guest taps, but there also um, just been an explosion of tap handles and bars uh, carrying a wider selection of beer uh, in you know on premise uh, bars and pubs. So it's uh, it's partly the brew pub phenom- phenomenon, which is you know where they make their own beer and there's a restaurant, and also um, just, uh, you know, consumer de- demand for a choice of uh, different kinds of beer. Chris, do you see a little bit like Tony here, the same the same view? 
Absolutely. Uh, like Tony said, there's an explosion of folks that are interested in producing and finding craft beer. So the, the variety of formats in which uh, beer is brought to the consumer is, is unique, whether it's small breweries that are packaging breweries. They might have a warehouse to larger folks like Sierra Nevada and New Belgium Brewing or uh, the brew pub uh, category, as, as you described. It's, it's, certainly, uh, it's certainly exploding right now, and um, at the end of the day, the consumer is, uh, is interested in these, in these great products. Brandon, from the ground level perspective, you are in the middle of this. Do you see do you see this as a uh, something exploding as well in, uh, on the stru- uh, street level? Sorry. Oh yeah, it's uh, you know one thing too is local. You know people are really about the local fad right now, uh, drinking local, eating local. Um, I think that's one thing a we bring to the table, not along with our beers, but we try to bring all of our food in local farms, uh, farm to table. So uh, people really appreciate that. And, uh, we're seeing a uh, very good customer base because of it. And that actually brings me to another question because we have this traditional restaurant sitting out here and the brew pubs, but they don't have to be mutually exclusive. And, Tony, you sent me some ideas about how restaurants can actually incorporate craft beer into their offerings. Can you share some of those ideas with our audience? Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, um, you know, the this craft brewing revolution is not exclusive to, to brew pubs, even though they, you know, make their own beer and that's definitely an attraction but um you know any bar or restaurant can really get involved by expanding the selection of beers um as brandon referenced you know there's a tremendous interest in, in, in local beer uh, pe- people consumers really tend like to take ownership of their local brew and uh, they're proud of it so i mean a, a restaurant can present uh you know a wider tap selection and maybe include a couple of local brews uh, they can also, I think, um, incorporate the beer aspect into their menus um, with pairing suggestions and, and even in the kitchen itself. And if they want to go a step further, perhaps present some beer dinners where, uh, you know, it's a, it's a particular thing with courses paired up with different beers. I think that's a great idea. Chris, have you seen some of that happening in the industry? Absolutely. Um, beer food is, uh, is really seeing a resurgence as well. Uh, uh, beer does pair uh, more naturally with food. All the, the many flavors that you can bring out of a, out of a meal. Um, uh, beer, you can do a lot more things with it than, say, wine or other beverages. So beer dinners and food and beer pairings have, have really um, uh, are, are seeing a, a tremendous new variety. Uh, we went through a lot of this in the 90s when brew pubs really took off, and then now I think chefs uh, in a broader level have gotten very engaged in, how, in what the various components are to a beer and how they can go with anything from an appetizer to a dessert. Brandon, from your perspective of Hop Alley, you know, you have obviously some seasonal food, seasonal beer. Are you doing the matching? Is it changed by season as well? Is, is that pretty much what you're, you guys are doing over there? Yeah, we are. Uh, we've done a couple beer dinners. Um, we really, when we do the beer dinners, we like stick it to the Belgian beers. Uh, we brew quite a few Belgian beers, and they really just uh, men, uh, go together well with food. Our chef loves doing uh, Belgian beers with his food. We do some exotic food when we do it. Um, you know, we use the rabbit, venison, uh, you know, obviously mussels being Belgian beers. Um, but, yeah, you know, we do that. We do a lot of uh, seasonal beers. Everything we pretty much do is seasonal. We have a seasonal menu, seasonal beers. Uh, we have yet to really kind of stick to a single brand beer where everything we like doing kind of complements the weather, the food, everything like that. So, so who, who leads you? Is the chef tell you, this is what I want to cook, and you match the beer, or you said, this is what I want to brew, and the chef match your brew? We've done both. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, we've done uh, this. We're actually about to do one here coming up at the end of January, or I'm sorry, February. And uh, he is, um, he kind of came to me and said, give me the beers, and uh, we'll sit around, drink them, and figure out some good food to go with them. Oh, sounds like a great way to make a living. And I want to circle around a little bit to talk about a bigger scale idea because, Tony, in the February-March issue of Ale Street News, you say, and I believe I have this quote right, while craft beering is currently high on the hog, the hand-wringing has already begun. Whispers of, quote, shakeout are growing louder. Tell us the answer to the question you pose at the end of this paragraph. Will there be enough room for everyone? Well, that remains to be seen. On the one side, you have uh, large craft breweries like Sierra Nevada and New Belgium who are expanding, in fact, building... um, New breweries and on the East 
coast, um, which I estimate very roughly, um, picking maybe top half dozen breweries that are expanding with new breweries, to add about 15% uh, capacity to the market. Now, if the demand keeps growing at double digits, then perhaps there won't really be a problem. But also, there's an explosion of what we call nano breweries, which are smaller than microbreweries. And they're very local, maybe perhaps doing batches of a half dozen up to 10 kegs at a time, maybe just serving at a couple of pubs in their town. But it still takes up uh, tap space. The Brewers Association estimates there's something like 1,700 uh, new breweries that are waiting to come online, and, and probably two thirds of those are these small nanos. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how, um, you know, how everything shakes out. And if, if the demand keeps growing, then probably there won't be a problem. So, Chris, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, no, I think Tony Tony hit on a lot of really good points there. Uh, the industry, the uh, last time the, the term shakeout was used about 15 years ago, uh, a, number of the, a number of breweries in the at the longer end of the tail, certainly uh, their business models were not very solid or their, 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 their beer was not very good. Uh, but at the end of the day, the consumer still wanted craft beer. And you, you look at the lead industry leaders now as, as Tony mentioned, Sierra Nevada, New Belgium, their business at that time continued to take off and flourish. So I think what what we're looking at is, is a period where there's a lot of growth, and in any industry when you have a lot of growth, you have to make sure that your business model is very sound. And for a, for a brew pub or a, or a local brewery, you really need to identify who your local customer is, why your experience is going to be unique to them, uh, and why the products you offer uh, match what they're looking for. Well, in that same vein, uh, Tony, I know talk about that before i think uh you had you did some classes about that education as far as uh you know this is a global trend and where are we as american brewers where is the u.s our uh, uh, stand on in, the, in this in this uh in the this u.s program? is front and central um in the craft brewing global craft brewing revolution um it was really the brewers here that um took hold of uh german and british styles and, and then belgian styles and, and really kind of pushed the envelope and, and really came up with some new um, tweaks to uh, India Pale Ale. IPA is pre- one of the most popular styles now, but brewers are making double IPAs with you know, extra hops, um, various things like that. And uh, brewers in different countries have really followed the lead of um, American brewers in the, in the craft beer thing, partly because of communication through the internet, um, the information is available. And then I think the other part is that um, there's been such a cooperative kind of aspect to this whole uh, craft brewing community, which which has extended, you know, into different continents now around the world. Brandon, do you see that as a as a local brewer yourself? I mean, you talk to people around the country, around the world. Do you see same thing that you feel like the American brewers are definitely leading this 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 wave? Uh, yeah, you know, I kind of agree with 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 what Tony was saying. Um, you know, Americans obviously most of the breweries started off as uh, Germans. Uh, all coming over, immigrating from Germany, where you get your Budweiser, Paps, Schlitz, Miller from. Um, and then we kind of made it our own, uh, which you see, you know, there's a lot of breweries now across the pond are imitating our styles. The IPAs, uh, especially, you know, the Belgian brewers are really starting to do a lot of their own unique uh, beers, but with American influence, uh, with the exception of really Germany, just because they're stubborn and they like their Pilsners and, and lagers <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, there is, a, there is uh, I guess, imitation would be the best word to describe it, of American breweries. Well, they say imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. But, Chris, let me follow up on that topic for a moment because um, we're talking about the U.S. taking the leadership role. Do you see, and then potentially there's, there's limited tap space, is the export of craft beers a way that we can continue the growth beyond our U.S. borders and keep the tap flowing as it may be? Uh, yes, uh, a number of breweries are definitely getting into the export side of the business. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we have a tremendous opportunity for craft beer and craft brewers in the United States as a core. But certainly some industry fo- leaders are getting into the export side. Brooklyn Brewery is about to uh, open a, a new facility in Sweden. Um, Rogue Ales has been exporting for years out from Oregon and, and others. And the Brewers Association has an export program which they facilitate American craft beer to to find its way uh, uh, across various oceans. Um, like I said, it, those, I think, are, are very good business extensions, but at the end of the day, we've got a really good opportunity here in the United States as well. Great. And, Tony, let me circle around to you because I want to talk a little bit about kind of the regulatory hurdles that some of the early brewers 
um, ran into, and I'd like uh, Brandon to weigh in on this from a local perspective, but are we through kind of those growing pains where certain municipalities had to alter longstanding liquor license codes to even accommodate brew pubs? And, and are, have we really removed all the barriers so that people can execute and get their operations up and running quickly? I'm sorry, was that addressed to, to me or Brandon? Yeah, uh, well, let's start with you, and then we'll let Brandon okay. give us the uh, well, local to, perspective. Uh, to a certain extent, that, that is true, but I think, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> breweries and microbreweries, nanobreweries, they're, are, they're kind of sexy now, you know, and, and people are happy to accommodate them. Um, but I think the other barrier that's probably been removed is um, the ability to find capital and uh, loans, bank loans. Um, back in the 90s, um, it was very difficult. Um, you know, to, to obtain those because craft brewing was not established and people didn't know about it. Um, but that's that's all changed now, and it seems like the, uh, the coffers have definitely opened up to what is you know successful business enterprise. That's great. So Brandon, tell us um, how tough is it? Was it to get licensed? Are we over the hurdles? Uh, <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, that's a it's a very state by state. Um, if you look at uh, California, Oregon. Wisconsin, North Carolina, they all have very lax laws when it comes to uh, manufacturing of uh, alcohol, uh, which is why you see so many breweries and brew pubs there. When you go to a state like Georgia, who is uh, way behind the ball, we're still trying right now just to be even to sell beer for consumers to take it off premise. Uh, right now, the only way you can drink beer on premise uh, without tasting samples is uh, to do a brew pub. I mean, if, you know, a, sweet, a brewery like Sweetwater, where I came from, if you uh, want to go in there and buy a case of beer, a growler beer, it's, uh, it's against the law, which is uh, putting a lot of uh, restrictions on breweries, which is uh, kind of talked about earlier with these nano breweries coming up. Uh, you know, nano breweries are great. They're, they're great for the community. You see a lot of them, uh, you know, on the West Coast, San Diego, Portland, uh, San Francisco. You don't see any here in Georgia. Uh, well, you know, we're part of the South, and we had all those moonshine laws on the books. They didn't want to make, let anybody be uh, crafting any alcohol at home. So those have to be rep, uh, removed so we can get, get in business. Right. Uh, it, you know, it's just, it, it's again, it's, it's state laws. Um, you know, I had a buddy of mine who opened up a brew pub up in uh, Cumming, and they pretty much had to get every single alcohol law on the books changed just so they can have a brew pub up in that county. Um, and, you know, again, it's it, it, it's very state by state. In some states, it's very wide open where you can go in there and it, you'll have no issues with others. It, it just takes forever. Like for us, it took us about seven months. Well, that's good information. Yeah. I think, Tony, you uh, want to jump in there? Well, yeah, Brandon is absolutely right. It's very, it is very uh, state by state. And, um, and it's unfortunate in some states. Um, one other big growth area, which, you know, for bars is takeout beer. Uh, Growl is a very popular liquid glass judge. Also, um, things like the Crafty Carton, which is more of a cardboard container. But um, draft beer is, is hot, and people in, in, in the states where it's, where it's legal, um, it's becoming quite a bit big business to, uh, you know, sell beer to go. But, um, uh, yeah, I, I um, sympathize with people in states where there's definitely a lot of uh, legal work to Done. We just changed the law here in New Jersey, actually, uh, last year to allow um, more uh, breweries, actually, uh, breweries as opposed to brew pubs, to sell beer, sell points of beer in their tasting rooms. So. But you guys mentioned, Brandon mentioned it, Tony just mentioned growlers, and, and Chris, um, is this something, I know it is in, in the South, there have been kind of, I know South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, has been, uh, actually there's not in Florida as I'm aware of, but um, it's very slow to take on is this something that we're going to see or is it going to take uh, you know take out delivery beer systems i mean you know we're going to see beer delivery you know you're going to order a pizza and beer finally together at your front door what's the future of the growler world i guess uh drones <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. uh actually we at carolina brewery we sold our first growler in 1996 we had to search the nation to find somebody who could sell us some bottles uh and, and immediately the growler uh, our growler pro program took off to represent, gosh, somewhere in the 20% range of our of our draft sales. Obviously, we're, as a brew pub, we all, all we have is draft. But um, so growlers, their, their popularity comes from the a real selling point from a brew pub, which is you will never find beer fresher than in a brew pub or a small brewery when you're on site. Uh, the consumer wants that and they want to take it home. So uh, 
I think you're seeing it now, and uh, I know in Virginia and South Carolina and in our area, um, there are now grocery stores, Whole Foods, for example, that has uh, growler filling stations. Um, if I, from the brewery's perspective, I think the growler filling stations in grocery stores and even in some places, convenience stores are very, very worthwhile. Although uh, on the on the quality control side, <clears throat> you have to make sure that your your business partner, the retailer, is doing a good job of keeping a facility clean uh, and and managing their draft beer program properly. Um, that said, uh, you know, in, in North Carolina, we just passed a uh, a, a growler to go law where growlers could be sold at at uh, locations outside of a brewery. So I think. And I think, as Brandon mentioned, out in the West Coast, um, this is something that's, that's seen regularly. So uh, so I think it's, again, something the consumer wants. It'll definitely take time. Okay, so, Tony, I just want to ask you to quickly give us an answer. Do you believe we've reached the saturation point, or is there continued growth in this model? I think there's continued growth. Um, everyone quotes uh, Kim Jordan, who's the president of New Belgium for a company, for a statement she made uh, back in the 90s, I think it was, end of the 90s. Um, at a conference that craft beer would, could reach 10% of the market, and everyone was kind of astounded she'd say that back then, but it, that appears like that will happen in the next couple of years. Um, and some people are now predicting the craft beer will go to 20% of the, of the market. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know if we'll go that high, but um, I don't think it's uh, reached anywhere near saturation. Okay, we'll continue our poll. Chris, what are your thoughts? Are we at saturation point or continuing to grow? No, we're definitely continuing to grow. I think uh, uh, Tony hit on the head. In fact, I was at a conference last week where the same guy who, who same economist, was suggesting uh, a 10 to 12 percent market share is now saying 20. And I think you see that in the um, in the consumers and choice with uh, a lot of the brands that we all have known for 35 years. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of the light beer or light lager drinkers are moving into craft beer and they're, they're, they're making a change of choice. So uh, I believe uh, the saturation point is, is, uh, is certainly not complete. Wow. Well, this is really fantastic information. You're on the air with the restaurant brokers and today we are talking about craft beer with the editor of Ale Street News and also all about Beer Magazine along with a local brewer. Remember, this is We Sell Restaurants. We operate the largest restaurant brokerage company in the nation based on the number of listings, transaction count, and volume. We are franchising nationwide and have offices in Florida, Colorado, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia. Stay tuned after the break where we're going to talk about the craft beer business and the beer industry in general with the restaurant program. 